Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing? Today is the next entry into the study of Esther uh, from the Time Warp Wife. Uh, Darling Schacht uh, is the one that created this. God is using her, I believe, in great ways. And I wanted to share Chapter 4 with you guys. I encourage you guys to read it uh, as you do your study. I hope you guys are reading it even now. Uh, you know, And I wanted to share some things with you from my perspective on this. Some of the things that I learned, and I had, and there are some questions, of course, uh, from this chapter that I hope and pray uh, you have clicked the link onto uh, to the study guide for Esther. But I, I have them here for you. Uh, let's first read this, all right, so we can get a better idea of what is taking place. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. And went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed, clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs, Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take a sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, or another word was Hathach. I think Hatak might, might be another pronunciation. The king, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend to her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hatach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was the front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the sum, the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, Shushan the palace, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go in to the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hatach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatach and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told him, so they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Esther told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Now this is very, very interesting. You already know, Haman went to King Ahasuerus and basically lied, telling him there were a group of people that were disloyal to the king that needed to be destroyed. He put on this good act. He didn't tell them who it was because I think if he had, as I said earlier, Ahasuerus would have never allowed it. But he lies to, uh, to King Ahasuerus by not 
telling the complete truth. And here's the result. A decree has been put out that every Jew, and this is done in the king's name, every Jew is to be killed. Now bear in mind with this, this is every Jew basically within the Persian Empire. People that would have included the, the remnant that came back to Israel. That's a scary thought, isn't it? And here, Mordecai's response, as well as among the Jews there within the palace area alone, and probably everywhere else, was what it describes here in these first three verses. When Mordecai found out, he put on sackcloth and ashes. He rent his clothes. This is, I want to explain what, what this, this is all about, okay? Basically, in the, near, in, in the ancient Near East, people tended to show their grief and pain in visible ways. Sackcloth and ashes in particular. According to one definition, sackcloth is a piece of clothing worn by people in times of sorrow or mourning. And ashes are just with loose soil crumbling into dust or the remains of any substance that's been burned in the fire. They were pretty, this was almost universally a sign of personal suffering or sorrow over the death either of a loved one, a lament and anguish over a calamity, a frustration over bad news, or military defeat. And I encourage you to check these verses in scripture out. Genesis 37 verse 29, 1 Samuel 4 verse 12, 1 Kings 21 verse 27, 2 Kings 18 verse 37, Daniel 9 verse 3, Jonah chapter 3 verse 6, and Matthew 11 verse 21. These are all very powerful instances of, of people who have done this, who mourn in sackcloth and ashes. And it says here, Basically, the definition with sackcloth, in case anybody is wondering, is this. I have this here from, of, of all the interesting places, I, I have this from, I have this from uh, the dictionary. I believe it is from, let me just double check. Uh, it, it's, it's basically from the dictionary. And the definition here, there's two different, it says a course cloth of goat or camel's hair or a flax, hemp, or cotton. Now it says here in my notes, in my Bible, that typically one's garments were torn, then a coarse and rough garment of goat or camel hair, a material also used as sieves, S-I-E-V-E-S, -E -E and strainers for sacks of grain was added, and finally ashes were sprinkled over the head. It also, it, it's basically, it's worn as a sign of mourning or penitence, also according to this definition. And you see in this, this is, this is Mordecai and every Jew's response. Mordecai and every Jew's response to this despicable deed. And as you can see, he does this right in front of the king's gate. He knows he can't go inside, but he does it right in front of the king's gate. Uh, one commentary says he more than likely did this within earshot of where Esther was. Esther finds out about this. She finds out that her cousin, this is her family member, is out there mourning in sackcloth and ashes, and she's wondering what in the world's going on. She's wondering, you know, is there something, you know, because I think she understood at least enough to know either th that this was extreme sorrow, that there was that, th that this was despair. So she goes to him through her personal assistant, Haytach, or, or, or uh, Hathak, or Haythak, however you pronounce it. That's going to say Haytach, okay? That's, that's how I pronounce it, sorry. But he says to Haytach to send to Esther, you need to see this. He hands him the decree. And, and says, you have her read this. This is what's going on. Our people, our people are in jeopardy. They're beyond in jeopardy. Here's a plot right here to destroy an entire race of people. And he says to Haytach, please go to the queen and tell her about this. Beg her to do something about this. 
he says, command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead and plead before him for her people. Mordecai was her guardian, so he's he's acting as the the authority figure here in her life. He's he's basically acting as as the parent, and, and he's begging her, "Go to your husband. This is what's going on. You need to please do something." Her response is a, a very logical one, and basically the the gist of it was she says basically here. It's known in the palace that nobody enters the king's area. Nobody goes before the king unless he sends for you. The, and if you go in there without being sent, without being invited, you're dead meat unless he, as it says here, accept the one to whom the king holds out his golden scepter that he may live. Otherwise, you're put to death. And I have something very interesting here that Darlene uh, said, according to the historian Josephus. During this time, the king had made a law that when he sat upon his throne, none of his people should approach him unless they were called. There were men with axes that 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 men with axes in their hands that stood around his throne in order to punish any that approached him without being called. That's scary. So this is what Esther's facing, and she says, "This is what I'm facing here. What do I do?" How can I go to the king when he hasn't called me in 30 days? And if I go in there, my head's on the line. But Mordecai says to her, you're in this too. I don't think he's doing this to be mean, but he's doing this to state a reality here from, and, and from verse 13 and 14. He says, don't, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. Uh, 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 the, the original King James translation, I believe, is another quarter. But he says here, but as but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He's stating here, you're in this too. They'll find out that you're Jewish and they'll kill you. The, I, I, the king, you know, they wouldn't care if you're the queen. That's kind of a sad statement, but one commentary says, Flatter not thyself with a vain hope that because thou art in the king's house and an eminent member of his family, even the queen, that thou shalt be spared or find any greater privilege in his house than the Jews do abroad. Thou art a Jew, and if the rest be cut off, thou wilt not escape. That's an interesting statement. And He's saying here that you're going to wind up being a victim too. You're going to wind up being killed more than likely because somebody's going to find out you're a Jew and you're gone. And he goes on to say, the commentator goes on to say, it is probable that God hath raised thee to this honor for this very season. We should every one of us consider for what end God has put us in the place where we are. And when an opportunity offers of serving God in our generation, we must take care to not let it slip. I, I find that very powerful. I find that statement very powerful because we, we are called to serve him. We are called to declare his name as, as followers of Jesus Christ. And I find it very interesting in this that Mordecai says, bottom line here, you're in this too. You're in this too, and you and 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 if you don't act on it, yes, God's going to deliver us, maybe through someone else, but you could wind up, you and your whole house could wind up getting destroyed or killed. And he, he was like, he did not want to see that happen to her. He cared for her a great deal. I, I believe Esther was pretty much like like his daughter. And Mordecai's, I, I mean, Esther's final reply was straight out of out here in, in, in verse 16. She says, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so will I go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Basically what happened here, she was basically stated, 
I'm willing to do this. I am, I see the importance of this. And she asks Mordecai and the people, the Jewish people, and maybe there may have been Persians who were on their side. Who knows? That's one thing I'd love to ask Esther when I get to heaven. She basically asks them to fast and pray for her for the next three days. No eating or drinking. This was a very specific type of fast. Fasting included, normally from what I've read on fasting, that it was a means of depriving the body of nourishment, preventing food from entering the mouth, abstaining from food. It often lasted from sunrise to sunset and could meet a partial or total abstinence or selective abstinence from certain food for a longer period. And for some, fasting was considered a means of attaining spiritual rewards, but this was, as this says here, this was done in a time in which they were seeking God's face for a critical matter. They were coming before the Lord. And you see other instances where people are doing this out of repentance, contriteness, seeking God, like, uh, you know, responding in national times of crisis. You, you see this after, you know, somebody does this after being confronted with sin in one's life, they respond in, in penitence and prayer and confession. And you see here that what they are doing here, she's asking them fast and pray. Don't eat or drink anything for the next three days. This was a very particular type of fast in which they weren't eating or drinking anything for the next three days. And she goes before him. She goes before the Lord Almighty in this moment, her and her maids. And it's interesting, uh, this one particular commentator describing it, and I want to share this with you because I thought this was very interesting. It says, abstain from all set meals and all pleasant food and as much as possible from all food for that space of time in token for, of humiliation for sin and a sense of unworthiness of God's mercies. So I believe this was, you know, fasting and praying and repentance, prayer, seeking God. And it says here, when it says, I also and my maidens will fast likewise. She's saying, I myself and all my servants here, my maidens, we're going to do the same thing. And this commentator states that they were doubtless either of the Jewish nation or proselytes and pious persons who she knew would sincerely join with her in these holy duties. And she basically says, I will go to the king, and if I die, I die. She says, all the, the commentator here states, I will venture and not count my life dear to myself, so I may serve God in his church. Although the danger may be great and evident, considering the expression expressness of that law, the uncertainty of the king's mind, and that severity which he showed to my predecessor Vashti. Yet, rather than neglect my duty to God and to his people, I will go to the king and cast myself cheerfully and resolutely upon God's providence for my safety and success. If I should be condemned to lose my life, I cannot lose it in a better cause. That was pretty much what, you know, what she meant, what, what, what this was about for her. And... I see so much in this with Esther. She's scared. She admits she's scared. But when Mordecai, put, you know, push comes to shove here, he says to her, Esther, you're not, you won't, don't think you're going to escape. If you, if you hold your peace, yeah, we're going to get delivered from, maybe from somebody else. But think of what will happen, all the bloodshed. And you could be killed too. And he says, who knows whether or not thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He's, it, it, basically, he's saying it is probable, according to the commentator, the commentator states, it is probable God hath raised thee to this honor for this very season. And I think as Christians, we should, every one of us consider for what end God has put us in the place where we are. And when an opportunity offers of serving God in our generation, we must take care to never, ever let it slip. I firmly believe that. I, I read this 
and, and, and I see so much. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, I see out of, that's out of, I'm reading from Joseph Benson's commentary on the Old and New Testaments in case anyone is wondering. But what I see here the most is this young girl, this young woman, she's scared out of her mind. When she sees that she's outraged, but she's scared out of her mind. But in the end, she chooses to trust the Lord. I encourage you guys to read not only Esther chapter 4, but also read chapter 5. Because that's the next chapter. But I want you to very carefully study the chapter 4 and ask God to show you things in it. I know he's showing me things. And there's also, I'm also including for tomorrow, which I'll share with you tomorrow, uh, when we come to recap this chapter, chapter four, there's some things I want to share with you that I'll, that I'll post um, that I, be I believe God is, is calling us in this area. But I want to, I want to make sure of something. Esther pointed out to Mordecai, yeah, that this wasn't going to be easy. But Mordecai believed that God was not going to allow his people to be destroyed. And he believed that maybe God was using Esther as a means of saving them. So she agreed. And she asked for this prayer for fasting and praying for three days. Because she wanted to, to, to be in the power. She, when she went to, the, went to do this, she wanted to do this in the power of the Lord. And I don't blame her. I, you know, I, this morning I was reading with what I was reading in my devotions. I believe this was a further example of how God was looking out for the nation of Israel. How this reminds me, this morning's devotions and this passage reminds me that God still loves and cares for us. No matter how much we screw up in sin, when we confess that sin, Yes, there's going to be consequences, but when we confess and repent, there's a promise of forgiveness and restoration. And I believe the Jewish people were clinging to that. They were people like Mordecai, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and so many others who were clinging to that. And God promised this to Israel. He promised this very thing to Israel when he told them, yes, he was going to send them into captivity for their sins against him. But he promised also that when they repented of their sins, that he was going to bring them back to their land. And restore to them all that had been taken. And I'm telling you right now, people, I believe this is being fulfilled even now as, I, as, as I'm speaking this. Because right now, first off, we've got the nation of Israel having existed, it being, being in existence. And it was officially made a nation in 1948. And many of the Jewish people are coming back there even now. I think we're living in extremely exciting times. We're living in, in the most unique times yet. We're witnessing God's plan of restoration for Israel, but also we're seeing spiritual restoration too. While Israel's enemies are plotting their destruction, God is still looking out for them. He's not going to stop doing so. He refers to Israel as the apple of his eye. And when just as God continues to both bless and, and, and protect Israel, he continues to protect and care for all those who've placed their faith and trust in him. A lot of times he's going to have to discipline us. But, you know, he promises when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which means we're restored back to him. We just need to be honest with God as to who we are and let him cleanse our hearts. And I think that's what es Esther and, and, and Mordecai and, and every one of the Jews were doing at that moment. They went to the Lord confessing their sins. They knew they were already returning back to Israel. But here were people that stayed behind, but they still chose to, to, to stick to following God. You see that, especially with Mordecai, when he refused to bow down to Haman. But also I see in this, I see in this a powerful decision that needs to be made. I see how Esther reminds me that in the end, no matter what others may try to do to God's people, to God's own, any person that puts their hand against God's own, including Israel, especially Israel, God will deal with them. And in the end, I hate to say this to the liberals, God wins. And I praise God that I live in a land here where I am free 
to practice and live my faith without any backlash, without any repercussions, with, without any garbage put against me. And for those who were inflicting the garbage and the backlash and the opposition against people like Baronel and the Kleins, they're, they're going to be judged. I already know that the, the, the guy that inflicted the unjust, illegal judgment against the Kleins has been judged because he tried to run for Secretary of State in Washington and failed. What does that tell you? Anytime somebody goes against God's own, God intervenes, and when he intervenes and judges the person that does it, that does inflict that harm, oh, watch out what happens. That's all I'm going to say. And that's the same thing here. You see right now what's being formed in this, you see what's being formed in this is God is working through this young girl, Esther. I encourage you to continue reading this book. Read chapter four and read chapter five. I would love to hear your feedback. Please send me your feedback. I want to I want to get your take on this. I really do. But above all, before I close this post, I pray that if any of you are faced with any hardships, hindrances, obstacles, persecution, or opposition from Satan of any kind from anyone, that you will choose to draw upon the Lord for your courage and strength and never be afraid to take that stand and continue to live your faith without fear of any reprisals. People, we live in a nation where we are free. We are free under the First Amendment to practice our faith. Regardless of what the liberals try to interpret the law, we're free if you are a, an, the owner of a business that deals with weddings, if a same-sex couple comes in, asks you to bake them a cake or give them flowers or cater to their wedding or, do, or, or sell any wedding-related items, you as a Christian have that right and responsibility to politely say no. Offer them somebody else that can do it. You tell them the truth as to why. You say, this goes against my faith, and if they come after you, count yourself worthy of it. Don't be mean about it, but don't be afraid to stand firm in the Lord. Choose to trust the Lord for courage and strength to face whatever is ahead of you. He's not ever, ever, ever going to fail you. Most of all, I pray that if there's anyone out there that does not know Christ, that you will choose to come to know him today. I say this before, and I'm going to continue to say this. Salvation is a completely free gift from God. It's one that cannot be bought or earned because if that were the case, then Christ would not have died for us. Salvation wouldn't mean a blooming thing. We'd have a lot of braggers and boasters in heaven. The best part of this is no matter what you've done, salvation can be for you too. Trust me right now when I tell you there's no such thing as many paths or other ways to heaven. And whoever told you that there's no such thing as God it completely lied to you. He very much exists. He is a just, holy, and righteous God who hates sin. But guess what? He loves you so much. And he proved that love by sending his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you, to set you free from your sin. Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, after shedding his precious blood on that cross for you, for me, and for the sins of the entire world, three days later, he rose again from the grave. And he's at the door of your heart right now. Asking, please let me in. Will you let him in? I'm inviting you right now to call on his name today. Ask him to forgive you of whatever sins you've committed. He'll forgive you. He doesn't care about your lifestyle, whether you're gay, straight, lesbian, a drug addict, prostitute, sex addict, anything about you. Whether you're Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, no matter what you are, who you are, where you're from, or anything about you, but he cares about your soul. Just that you open your heart to him and let him in today. Don't let your pride keep you from knowing Christ as your savior, but choose to experience the ultimate gift of love. Choose to accept his amazing, perfect grace. Ask him into your heart today. There's a link I have here where you can click on it and Ask the Lord to come into your heart, or if you'd like, why don't we right now just take some time and pray. 
You don't have to pray my exact words, but if you mean it with all your heart, then that's all that matters. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I do things that my sin dishonors you. And I know because of it that I deserve to be in hell. But I know that you love me so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. And that he shed his precious holy blood for my sins. And he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again from the grave. And I'm here to state that I believe that Jesus is your son and that he died for my sins. And I choose right now to accept him in my heart. Please come and save me, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and save me. Cleanse me of my sins. Wash them away with your precious blood. Make me whole and make me your child. Thank you so much for saving me and for giving me the gift of eternal life. And I will serve you for all of my days. In your name, I thank you. Amen. If you've prayed that or anything similar, clicked on that link and, pray, and, and made that decision to come to know Christ and meant it with all your heart. I welcome you into the family of God. I want to help point you in the right direction. Um, give me, send me a message and let me know whether or not you, you've accepted Christ. I want to help point you in the right direction of maybe a good local church. Help you any way possible. I don't claim to know everything, but I'll do whatever I can to help you. I've got to get going, but I wish you all a really wonderful evening. And I pray that when you are faced with that moment, when you are faced with the moment of whether or not to stand up for Christ or be silent, that you will refuse to be silent, but that you will stand up for him with everything that you have, that you will choose to stand for him. There's a statement out of the movie God's Not Dead 2. I'd rather stand with God and be judged by the world than to stand with the world and be judged by God. You have a decision. What is it? Are you going to stand up for yourself for the, in the Lord? Are you going to stand up for your faith? Are you going to be like Esther and go before the king of kings? Seek his face. Are you going to stand up for what you, what you know is right, what you believe in according to God's word? Or are you going to remain silent? It's your choice. Well, listen, I've got to get going. Uh, it's Monday and you have a few, you know, I've got a few things to take care of. But I wish you all a really awesome evening. And remember, no matter what, God loves you and he will restore you. And he is there beside you every step of the way. And he's never going to let you go. Bye for now.